As far as wrestling games go, it seems that there are two types of people in this world. These people and these people. As much as I love what this had to offer, I can't deny the fact that this game forever changed my perspective of what a wrestling game could and should be. I mean, this one really set the bar high because the inclusion of... Okay, hold on, back up. I'm getting ahead of myself, so let's start from the beginning. The year was 1989. Okay, yeah, that's that's probably a little too far back. Let's see, forward a little bit. Okay, yep, right there. With the success of the SmackDown series on the Sony PlayStation, the franchise would continue onto the next generation powerhouse that would be known as the PS2. And in 2001, we would see the release of WWF SmackDown, just bring it. And while it was a solid effort from publisher THQ and the fine development team at Ukes, it didn't do anything revolutionary. With just slightly improved visuals, not many additional features, and the now notorious yet hilarious commentary. We can't take our eyes off this match! Oh! The SmackDown series had yet to make that canvas rattling impact. But it wasn't far from it, because you see, in late 2002, WWE SmackDown Shut Your Mouth would hit store shelves and would improve on just about every single aspect of the series, from the robust story mode, the stunning new visuals, improved gameplay, better entrances, expanded roster, higher quality sound, more match type options, you get the point. It was bigger and better. Ukes poured their hearts and souls into this one, and it was really easy to see the passion that the team had for the project, because the evidence was apparent in the end product. With both PS2 ventures clearly becoming successes, each exceeding the sales numbers needed to earn Greatest Hits re-releases, it was back to the drawing boards to draft up the next installment in the series, confident that they could not only recreate the excitement that Shut Your Mouth invoked, but even exceed it. With a North American release date of October 27, 2003, WWE Smackdown Here Comes the Pain would hit store shelves to great fanfare. So what was in store for gamers as they booted this one up for the first time? Let's dive deeply into this one to find out. While Just Bring It would feature an intro comprised of stunning pre-rendered CGI for the first time, Shut Your Mouth would transition us into a live-action opening sequence, and Here Comes the Pain would follow suit, giving us the theme song and video package used for the SmackDown television show during the time. Now, many are aware that I wasn't a huge fan of the menus in the first few SmackDown games, but by this point in the series, this category had progressed quite a bit in quality, featuring large font with an easy-to-navigate layout, and incorporating in-game models of the wrestlers performing their signature taunts while you ponder which one of the many game modes you'll select. After which you'll be thrusted into the immersive roster featuring many of the promotion's biggest stars, future standouts, and legends of the past. It's almost hard to imagine that during this time guys like Big Show, Booker T, Brock Lesnar, Jericho, Guerrero, Edge, Goldberg, Kane, Kevin Nash, Kurt Angle, Randy Orton, Ric Flair, DVD, stupid autocorrect, RVD, The Rock, HBK, Austin, Triple H, and Taker were all part of the active roster for the promotion at the same time, and thus included here. This would also mark the series debuts for more than a few superstars, including the likes of Batista, Rey Mysterio, Benjamin and Haas, Rhino, Goldberg, Scott Steiner, and future golden boy, John Cena. This would also mark the first game to feature both Vince McMahon and Eric Bischoff together, so we could finally see that match that was never meant to be back at Slamboree 1998. With legends like the Road Warriors, okay, okay, hold on. Let me stop here for a minute because I wanna talk about this new overall rating system. Animal is a 90, Ric Flair is only 75. What? Okay, HBK gets an 80 and DiBiase in 86? I, I don't, I don't really know what's going on here. Uh -huh. Anyway, with legends like the Road Warriors, Iron Sheik, Jimmy Snuka, Roddy Piper, Sergeant Slaughter, Ted DiBiase, the classic Deadman, and a few others joining the bunch, it's quite the introduction to a long-standing tradition within the series that started right here. 
We also see divas such as Victoria, Trish, Tori Wilson, Stacey Keebler, Sable, Lita, and Jazz included here. There's even quite the list of wrestlers that were planned to be included but didn't make the final cut, including Jeff Hardy, Nunzio, Hulk Hogan, Ultimate Warrior, Billy Gunn, Al Snow, Hardcore Holly, and William Regal, just to name a few. Some of these were a lot further along in development than others, as evident by moves in the create modes that still feature the names of some of these superstars, to files hidden within the game's data, like these select screen images for Hogan and Warrior. And while we're discussing these pictures, I'd like to point out that Here Comes the Pain would mark the first game in the SmackDown series to feature pre-rendered CGI photos of each wrestler, as all of the other games that preceded this one contained real-life images of said superstars. I'll say that most of these look really accurate, and even the ones that aren't perfect are still completely identifiable, so that's a good thing, because that's not always the case these days. <laughs> Let's talk attire options, because just like in Shut Your Mouth, we do have some choices here. Because that game introduced alternate selections to the series, and that continues here as well, though it isn't offered for every wrestler on the roster. In fact, many of them don't feature any other attires, but for those that do, I'm thankful. We see Stephanie McMahon dressed to impress in her business best, or ready to tie it up in her in-ring gear. You can select from Big Papa Pump's black and red tights, or throw them into some jeans and sneakers for that just lounging around the yard on a Saturday afternoon look. Triple H has not one, not two, but three attire options here with his commonly used black trunks, his red trunks, and the short-lived and, in my opinion, vastly underrated purple trunks. In addition to The Rock's wrestling gear with either red or blue accents, he can be seen here in his Hollywood-era black leather getup, which he wore at the episode of Raw in my hometown of Sacramento, where he famously insulted my entire city in musical form. Thank you very much. We see red tights for HBK, and even that horrendous unfinished brown attire from Survivor Series 2002. Yuck. One thing I always thought was rather unique here was how the default attire for Chris Jericho features him clean shaven while his alternates give him a goatee. It's kind of cool. We would also see multiple looks for guys like Kurt Angle, Stone Cold, Eric Bischoff, Brock Lesnar, Undertaker, and Kane amongst others. Some of these are really minor differences like Big Show's one strap versus two strap options, but hey, they're options and I can't be mad at that. So yeah, while we don't get alternate attires for each and every member of the roster, things are definitely headed in the right direction. SmackDown JBI would mark a pivotal change in the series in terms of entrances, as this would be the first time we witnessed fully rendered start-to-finish animations exclusively featuring in-game assets. While these weren't perfect, they laid the foundation for which Shut Your Mouth would greatly improve on, and that pattern continues here as well, with wrestlers featuring their own unique taunts and many that see distinctive walking animations, special lighting, and realistic pyro. And man, some of this pyro really was impressive for the time. Those puffs of fire that emit from the stage during Booker T's entrance still hold up to this day. And the way Goldberg blows smoke out of his nose was such a minor detail that added a ton of realism. Another one that's always seemed to be hit or miss throughout the years is Kane's in-ring pyro, but it really looks spectacular here. Others like Y2J, Kevin Nash, Brock Lesnar, HBK, and Kurt Angle are really represented accurately and visually just look really good. I mentioned lighting, and that's something I wanted to touch on a bit more because whether it's the green tones of the Hurricanes entrance or the dark multicolored ambiance of the game's theatrical-like march down to the ring, it all looks really good here and emulates quite faithfully what we were seeing on television at the time. It's not all perfection here, however, as you'll notice many wrestlers who share the same in-ring animation or walking transitions. There's also the quite noticeable absence of ring announcing, something that was present in both of the PS2 ventures that preceded this one. And man, those legend entrances, I never liked them. Honestly, it just seems like some of these entrances just didn't receive the same level of attention that others did. Others being the likes of Austin, where they really nailed the energy of his walk, as well as his corner taunt animation. Or The Undertaker, who races down and around the ring on his motorcycle. 
and looks really damn cool doing so, I might say. Now, obviously, the bigger name stars are going to get this treatment, but it's nice to see some of the more decorated entrances from the mid-card talent replicated quite nicely here. Gold Dust makes his way down to the ring under those glimmering gold lights with that cinematic widescreen filter and even removes his wig just as he did in real life. While Matt Hardy makes his version 1 debut here, complete with that glorious monster magnet theme. Ah, yes. Entrances aren't available for all match types, but you'll be able to view these for the majority of them. And really, I could go on and on about entrances, and I mean, would you look at that? I kind of did. So let's move on to the gameplay. If you've played any of the SmackDown games up to this point, you'll feel right at home here. In fact, even those brand new to the series could start here with this one and become accustomed rather quickly because this game is the definition of user-friendly. Let's take a look at the basic control layout. The left control stick is used to move your wrestler, but if you're old school and feel like using the D-pad, you can do that as well. X is used to strike, with repeated inputs resulting in combos, and stronger, more unique variations executed by including a directional button into the mix. So for example, if you're Kevin Nash and you want to deliver a big boot, you'll press down and X simultaneously. And no, I don't have any quad jokes for that one, so just insert your own, I guess. Triangle is still reserved for running. Square is used for accessory motions like picking up and dropping weapons, getting in and out of the ring, tearing off turnbuckle pads, and so on. And taunting is performed by moving the right analog stick. One thing that was overhauled after last year's entry is the game's grappling system. However, it hasn't changed to the point where there's a learning curve. It's really just been refined. This year, there are four different tie-up positions for front grapples, which are initiated by pressing any of these directions with the circle button. Up is where you'll find the power grapples, down is for submissions, left for signature moves, and right is designated for quick grapples. Once you're in the desired position, you can perform moves by once again pressing circle with any of the directional commands. This brings the total amount of front grapples to 16, which helps to increase not only the replay value, but also the fun factor. And fun is good stuff, right? Pressing circle on its own near an opponent will perform an Irish whip, and with a slightly delayed press of any directional button, you can send your foe anywhere you please. The reversal and blocking system has also seen some changes since SYM, as in that title and those before it, simply tapping the square button at the appropriate time would either block or counter an attack. But by this point in the series, we see dedicated buttons with L2 used to reverse or block strikes and R2 for grapples. This adds a bit more strategy to the mix as the days of just spamming the square button and reversing just about everything are all but dead. R1 changes enemy focus when the game isn't too busy doing it on its own, and L1 performs your wrestler's smackdown or finisher. Ah yes, finishers. Each wrestler features two of these special moves, with the secondary being pulled off by pressing L1 with any directional button. And like a nod to the old Aki titles, you can even steal an opponent's finisher by pressing both L1 and L2 together. Some people refer to this as doing a red smackdown due to, well, obvious reasons. It's also important to note that in order to achieve this, you'll need at least two stored smackdowns. These special moves can either be earned by successfully performing grapples, submissions, strikes, and taunts, indicated by this meter up here, or by simply giving yourself up to five of them when selecting your wrestler. Shut your mouth is about the time that move animations really started to stand out in the series, and this is something that carries over into this entry. Because as the series progresses with each installment, we would see many new animations added. And I can honestly say that a lot of these moves are stunning, and the impact that most of them deliver have not been topped since, in my opinion. You're just not going to convince me that Goldberg's spear has or will ever look better than in this game here. The personality captured in these move animations is something that needs to be applauded, with RVD wincing in pain after hitting a 5-star frog splash, or Booker T finishing off a fantastic looking scissor kick with a spin -a rooney Austin's in-your-face taunting after a stunner really adds an extra layer to the experience, 
as do others like HBK's post Sweet Chin Music Dance or Triple H venting his frustrations after a pedigree. And with some finishers featuring multiple variations, we see an added level of diversity here. So you can deliver a standard looking F5, which in itself is pretty devastating, or you can fling your opponent into the air like a stuffed animal if you're feeling extra malicious. Now don't get me wrong, there are still some finishers that aren't quite up to the standard set by others, like the Big Show's Chokeslam, which has been recycled for many games at this point. But for the most part, everything here looks fantastic. I can still remember taking this game home on launch day and hitting a 619 for the first time. It was nothing short of epic. Oh, and this version here of The Undertaker's Chokeslam is still probably my favorite to this very day. Somebody told me 2K22 hits different. No, no, my friends. Here comes the pain does. And it's not just finishers that look great, as many of these moves have very fluid yet hard-hitting animations, from all of the wrestler-specific strikes like Brock's vicious-looking clotheslines, to Booker T's kicks and The Rock's famous right hands. Grapple moves like the mat-rattling impact of Kurt Angle's Germans are spot on, as are those Steiner belly-to-bellies, and of course Triple H's face-buster knee thingy. I truly do believe that many of these look better than what we would see in the most recent releases, but I'm probably pretty biased. In addition to your more commonly used attacks, there are corner grapples both high and low, so you can kick your opponent in the nuts or gyrate your cellulite infested butt right into their face. Diving attacks from the turnbuckle look and feel fantastic, and I always found it rather amusing that they included the awkward looking shooting star press for Lesnar. Can't forget about those standing and running attacks from inside the ring to the outside. Oh, ouch. And of course, running strikes and grapples, which if you haven't noticed by my footage, are some of my favorite moves to do. In addition, there are many ground strikes and grapples that range from brutal beatings to submissions and droppings of legs. While we still see the early format of double team moves included here, you know, the ones which consist of grappling your opponent after he or she has been sent into the corner nearest your tag partner. Yeah, those weren't always the best as they were only available with a tag format, but thankfully that has changed by this point because you can also perform these moves by having two wrestlers simultaneously grapple with another, and this can be done anywhere in the ring. And this isn't even covering everything in full detail as far as controls go because if we did that, well, this video would go on for days. But regardless of the amount of depth here, it's all very easy to pick up and play, and honestly very addictive. Take a look at the HUD. Seriously, look at it. You might notice something new here, as these blue body-shaped icons represent the new location-specific damage system. Target a certain area of a wrestler's body enough, and you'll start to see the area change color, eventually turning red when fully damaged. This helps to strategically determine how your next slam, strike, or submission hold might affect the match. Are your opponent's legs full-blown rubber at this point? Well, that next walls of Jericho might just be all that's needed to end the match. You'll also notice that wrestlers who have taken quite the beating will hobble around the ring or stand there in a daze for a bit. And while this would be the first time this feature was included in a SmackDown game, it actually debuted in the Yuke's developed Japanese exclusive the Pro Wrestling, yes, yeah, that's, that's what it's called, released in 1999 on the PlayStation using the same game engine as the original SmackDown. While I've admittedly praised the gameplay, I wouldn't be able to say that everything runs smoothly at all times. There is occasional slowdown in multi-man matches, specifically during camera angle cuts, and the AI tends to do really weird things at times. Also due to updates throughout the years to the game engine, which allow for moves to transfer from one surface to another mid-animation, there are the occasional strange anomalies. Ultimately though, this one takes what the early games had started with and adds to it a refined, more pronounced experience. Yeah, it's still an arcade-heavy engine, with wrestlers occasionally somersaulting around the ring or falling from six-story buildings and walking away, but it's been honed in a bit. It's matured like a fine wine, if I might say so myself. 
And since we gave some love a bit earlier to the entrances, let's take a moment to acknowledge the post-match festivities. While there are more than a few of these that are rather generic, for example, you'll see this one quite a bit, the ones that are wrestler specific are done well. Nothing like seeing Austin having a few celebratory cold ones. It's just a shame that the post-match options from Shut Your Mouth can only be found here within the game's season mode. You know, the ones where you can attack or respect or taunt and all that fun stuff. I like options. Now let's venture into a category that is near and dear to my heart, and that would be the arena selection. We have quite the amount of choices here, with weekly shows being represented by Raw in all of its slanted Titantron glory, and SmackDown appearing here with the beloved Fist design. During this time in the promotion, the ringside commentary tables were moved up to the side of the stage area for the Raw brand, something we saw during the most successful years of WCW, and it's a nice little touch that they included here in the game. We also see A and B versions of these shows, which might appear to be the same upon first glance, but look closely and you'll notice the venues are different, with distinct interior appearances along with unique exterior locations when venturing outside of the building during a hardcore match. Alongside these top tier shows, we see the inclusion of Sunday Night Heat and Velocity, which use the Raw and SmackDown stages respectively while changing out on-screen graphics, video packages, and ring aprons. And might I add that I genuinely miss Sunday Night Heat. I don't know what it is, it wasn't necessarily a great show, but there was just something so refreshing about watching an hour of wrestling on a Sunday evening. Okay, back to the arenas. Because Ukes would hit us with 14 pay-per-view options to choose from here, with the 2002 versions of Vengeance, SummerSlam, Unforgiven, No Mercy, Rebellion, Survivor Series, and Armageddon. Joining the lineup would be the 2003 designs for Royal Rumble, No Way Out, WrestleMania 19, Backlash, Judgment Day, Insurrection, and Bad Blood. And not that weird spelled version from the 90s. In my opinion, the 2000 to around 2004, maybe 2005 era, is the absolute pinnacle for stage designs, so it brings me much joy to see computer-generated versions of these arenas. Despite some of the minor inaccuracies, like the narrow ramps that were used for shows like Insurrection and Rebellion, replaced by wider versions here, everything is pretty spot on for the most part, because alongside these set pieces, we see lower thirds, graphics, and ring areas representing their real-life counterparts quite realistically. And I love how the gameplay camera angles position to where the stage area can be seen constantly in the background, because even though that isn't very lifelike when compared to a WWE television broadcast, it's just very pleasing to the eyes, and sadly, this would be the last game in the series to feature this angle by default. As you'll hear quite a bit in this video, Shut Your Mouth was the game that really put this series on the path to greatness, with many innovations and technical upgrades such as visuals. If you compare Just Bring It to its sequel, you'll notice quite the difference. And while I can't say that this one looks better than its predecessor, it definitely looks, at the very least, just as good. Character models look very realistic, from facial textures to hair and attires. There's a ton of attention to detail here, and when these assets are paired with personalized taunts, moves, and fighting stances like Jericho just standing there talking trash, it really makes for an authentic experience. Yes, this game looked great in 2003, but it's also aged quite well. And it's not just the wrestlers themselves that look good, because the environments are pretty true to life as well. Those stage and ringside areas feel properly proportioned, and the crowd now features some 3D polygons. Uh, especially like this guy. Sadly, you can't play within the audience as you once could in Just Bring It, nor can you climb the fist of the SmackDown stage as seen in Shut Your Mouth, but there are other explorations to be had, which we'll touch on shortly. I've always enjoyed the pre-matchup screens with wrestler models performing their taunts, which was something we actually saw on TV during this time, which again is another feature that helps bring a sense of authenticity to the game. The sound department features a bunch of hard-hitting, energetic tunes that are sure to get you feeling like it's time to smash faces into canvas. And it's a good thing that the music is so chaotic because there's a serious lack of commentary here. 
because even though it was sparse and not always highly regarded, it was at least included in the previous PS2 releases. It's funny though, because I always forget that this one doesn't feature commentary and barely even noticed it upon release, so it's safe to say that it isn't really missed, not by me at least. Not to say I wouldn't have liked to have it included. We do however get referee voice clips for most matches and wrestler specific chants from the audience. I especially like the shave your back chant for A-Train. Rounding things off are the sound effects which are all very impactful here, such as chair shots, slams onto the mat, and even strikes. We don't get any wrestler grunts or groans or anything like that as some previous grapplers would feature, but it still all comes together nicely. Here comes the pain would hit us with a few new match types, but before we get into those, let's talk about what returns here first. Sure, you can jump into a singles match or team up with a partner to take on a duo of opponents. There's even stuff like Handicap, Triple Threat, and Fatal 4-Way, but venture a bit deeper into the list and you'll find where the true stars of the show shine, and that would be the main events. Yes, this is where you'll find the big guns, like the cage match, which hasn't changed much over the years, though we do see many ways to play here, including single, tornado, triple threat, and fatal four-way in the traditional climb up and out format. Simply keep your opponent down long enough, climb the cage with the square button, and press up continuously until you reach the top. From there, you can go for the win or... <sighs> Why'd I do that? And for those afraid of heights, you can even partake in this match type with pin and submission rules. Hell in a Cell is back in all of its glory, but don't let the initial appearance deceive you, because though it may seem like you're confined to the interior of this giant steel behemoth, that couldn't be further from the truth. Not only can you break out of the cell, but you can also take that sphincter puckering trek to the top. And as many of you might remember from the first three games in the series, there used to be this sort of invisible safety barrier up there so you wouldn't accidentally fall off, and it actually made you put in a little work in order to throw an opponent down. But all of that changed with Shut Your Mouth because the developers realized that this is a lot more fun. Seriously, this simple adjustment to the match type just one game ago really opened up a whole new experience here, because alongside the ability to select up to six participants in the match, things can and most likely will get absolutely ugly atop this hellish structure. From kamikaze spears to death-defying power bombs, this is one match type that continues to thrive when paired with the over-the-top game engine. And in 2022, nearly 20 years since the game release, it's still as fun as the first day I brought this one home. The ladder match. A race to the top. A race to the top. Where the goal is to grab a hold of that precious gold. Hang on long enough and the belt is yours. There's no minigame like prompts here as we would see later in the series, but you'll still need to be strategic as opponents can and will hang from you, as well as throw your ladder to the ground while you helplessly tumble down with it. Wrestlers can also perform grapple moves atop the ladder, diving moves from the ladder, corner moves onto the ladder, and you can even throw your foe atop a lying ladder, followed by a grapple move or flying attack if you're feeling self-destructive. So yeah, the objective remains the same, but the many options offered up on the journey to victory should keep one entertained along the way. The following match type has been sponsored by the Dudley Boys. Have you ever desired to forcefully send somebody crashing through a foldable wooden table? Do you long to dive from heinously high places, driving your body into another while also crashing through a foldable wooden table? Then look no further because the new and improved table match is now available in WWE SmackDown. Here comes the pain for the PlayStation 2. Send your opponent crashing through hundreds of wood fragments as you choke slam, spear, and F5 them. Oops. Straight into the depths of hell. One table not enough? Use two. Two wrestlers not enough? Choose six. Feel like adding insult to injury and making your enemies smell your butt? I mean, yeah, you, you could do that. Too, I guess if that's your thing, but ultimately this is a table match. So grab some wood, place somebody's lifeless carcass upon it, and make them regret every decision.
decision they've ever made up to this point in their life. Available now. If you played this match type in the first few SmackDown games, you'll remember that table moves were limited to just a handful of options like the Power Bomb and Pile Driver, and the occasional specialty like the Rock Bottom. Sure, you could perform any aerial move that you wanted, but otherwise things were pretty limited. But as the series would progress with gameplay options, most notably starting with Shut Your Mouth, we would be given the freedom to make more out of our matches, such as having the ability to perform any move that we please on top of these tables. That is, if you can keep the animation from drifting off of said table. This often results in some hilarious scenarios that aren't necessarily designed to happen, but definitely bring an added layer of entertainment to this match type. But gradual upgrades such as these is what helped elevate this series, because being able to hit the stunner or the pedigree through a table is something that would really breathe new life into matches like these. And that's a good thing. The TLC match is like a big wonderful blended version of a table match, a ladder match, and a hardcore match all in one. Not only can you select this one in multiple formats, such as Tornado, Triple Threat, and Fatal 4-Way, but you also have the ability to choose the winning condition as well. So if you wish to play this one under traditional ladder match rules, you'll need to grab that title hanging above the ring in order to score the win. Otherwise, pins and submissions will be the path to victory here. Now we've touched on those special ladder moves and even the freedom we now have with using tables, but we've yet to discuss the weapon grapples. While not new to the series here, these are yet another way the developers have innovated the gameplay mechanic, leading to even more ways to punish your opponent. RVD even has the ability to perform the Van Daminator here, which is pretty Van Dam awesome. And this seems like the perfect transition into the hardcore match discussion, though it isn't one of the many that are classified here as a main event, but I want to talk about these weapons more because these unique moves are available for each and every weapon you find. Sure, many of them are basic, such as the trash can lid sharing the DDT with the chair, or pretty much any longer object used to choke the life out of your opponent. But then there are standouts like the waste bin, which can be dumped over your opponent's head, or the fire extinguisher, which you can spray right into his or her face. You can throw another wrestler into a shopping cart and send him crashing down onto the pavement, jackass style, or even drag that poor bastard around the parking lot hanging from the side of a motorcycle. The mighty forklift even makes a triumphant return, and you can now... I guess... raise and lower the forks? I mean, is this even hurting him? And that guides us into the wonderful world of backstage areas, because though there may not be as many of these settings as we've seen in previous titles, it's safe to say that everything included here is state-of-the-art chaos. In the parking lot, you can slam wrestlers on the cars, and even have Diesel climb on top of a Diesel to perform the scariest jackknife imaginable. Head back to the gym for a flashback to those high school years of being stuffed into your locker, or given the old swirly, Mmm. There's bats and barbells and even a CRT television that can and should be used for unintended purposes. You can even jump on the treadmill or completely break through walls just to cool off in the shower. This one was always one of my favorite areas as I would constantly press this button, sending this cart flying out of the roll-up door, thus aggravating my friends beyond belief. <laughs> You can also slam wrestlers through the top of this cage-like structure or just throw them clean off the edge. Even little things like being able to toss your opponent into this crate thing and then watching them crawl out all dazed and confused brought so much entertainment. But it's safe to say there was one area that above all others took the cake. Times Square. Ah yes, flashbacks of falling from multiple stories up, hanging from helicopters searching for that perfect opportunity to dive bomb my opponent and almost never actually hitting him. And of course, dodging that New York City traffic. The SmackDown series never really took itself too seriously, but I can still remember being in absolute disbelief here. And honestly, I can't say that many moments in gaming during this time would top that feeling of finally landing the perfect diving attack from the highest point in the entire game. And moments like these are what made the hardcore match so special. 
I know that me and my friends spent countless hours here wasting many of our youthful days away, as have many of you. The freedom to venture from area to area, the interactive environments, the over-the-top shenanigans that couldn't be inflicted during a normal match, these are the things that kept me coming back here, and not just for months, but at this point nearly two decades. The submission match consists of two different format options, with the first requiring a single submit to win, in addition to the ultimate submission match where the wrestler with the highest number of submits by the end of the time limit is declared the winner. Submission holds here are of the button mashing variety with a sort of tug of war meter attached to holds. The player who taps the buttons the quickest will have the meter move in their favor, whether that be offensive or defensive. If you're close enough to the perimeter of the ring with traditional rules set in place, it's also possible to sway the meter towards a rope break. Be mindful though that you'll want to be strategic in selecting your wrestler as some superstar movesets and attributes aren't best suited for this match type and will probably get you nowhere. There's also the last man standing where the goal is to leave your foe lying for a count of 10. And of course the lumberjack match where the ring is surrounded by a bunch of pissed off testosterone fueled tough guys ready to rough you up if you dare leave the safety of that ring. And who could forget the special referee match? also available with multiple sub-options such as having two referees, and even an Iron Man variety. You are however limited to just a few roster options to select from as far as who will officiate the match, but they did include the ability to use created wrestlers, which is... Uh, fun. And then there's the Slobber Knocker, the one match type in the game that completely neglects the difficulty levels selected by the player in the options menu, meaning you will get reversed and quite frequently, so deal with it. But to be fair, on the flip side of things, due to the nature of the match type, each opponent can be pinned or KO'd rather quickly, like sometimes within seconds. You can go for a timed version here to see how many wins you can rack up before the clock hits zero, or turn it off for a true test of endurance going for your max number of pins, submissions, and knockouts before receiving one of your very own. Everybody's favorite match named after a superhero is here as well, and the goal is to gather the most pinfalls, submits, and KOs within the time limit. Even countouts work here and are extremely cheap and irritating, which is the exact reason why I always preferred this method to stack up the points when playing against a friend. Yes, I'm evil. There's even the elimination tag, which can be enjoyed all sorts of ways, but let's be honest, that's not the elimination match type you're here to see. Because new to the series, we see the introduction of one of the most dangerous environments to ever surround a WWE ring the WWE Universe. I mean the Elimination Chamber. Six superstars battle it out, starting with two wrestlers in the ring, followed by the rest being released from his or her chamber, one at a time until all have been freed. This happens at random, so there might be some patience required if you're not one of the first to enter the playing field, but I guess that's all sort of part of the suspense. You can exit the ring where steel grates make up the floor surrounding, in addition to climbing the interior of the structure where you can dive down onto an opponent or perch yourself atop one of the four chambers like a freaking gargoyle. These can also be accessed from the top turnbuckle as well, where flying attacks can and should be attempted. And if you really have a grudge to settle, you can send your opponent crashing through the glass of the chambers, which of course is absolutely satisfying. Hence the name of the match, the objective is to eliminate each and every participant and then watch them get up and vanish into thin air as they leave a wretched stench of defeat behind. What? And though not quite as impressive as completely disappearing, you can You can glitch your way out of the chamber, free to explore You can glitch your way out of the chamber, free to explore the previously uncharted territories of the arena. And when I say arena, I'm talking about the Survivor Series arena because this is the lone option for this match type. So you won't be having a chamber match at WrestleMania, for example. But it's not like it matters much because between the fact that there are no entrances for this one and this monstrosity takes up most of the screen, you won't be seeing the ring or stage area anyway. 
unless you exploit the game and glitch out. This match type, along with a few others, supports up to six players with a multi-tap device and is the main reason that I went out and bought one of these back in the day because not unlike many of the other modes of play here, this one is highly enjoyable with a few friends. But even solo, this one is worth the price of admission alone and ranks up there with the likes of Hell in a Cell in the replayability department. The second of the new matches is the bra and panties match, also known as the bikini match in Japan. Let's be honest, in this more politically correct landscape we live in today, well, this concept doesn't really fit into this new world. But during this time, we were fresh off the heels of the late 90s, where Jerry Springer and Howard Stern ruled the media. Hugh Hefner was idolized and alive, and objectifying women was not only allowed, but also considered, well, just being a man. So you might wonder, how does a match type like this translate into a video game? Well, control-wise, it's a bit like the submission matches. The goal is to strip your opponent down to her undergarments, which is done by pressing down and circle simultaneously to either a standing opponent or lying. This will initiate a meter where button mashing is required to either escape the hold or rip off an article of clothing based on your position. The diva to lose both pieces of clothing and be left standing in her underwear will be the loser and is forced to take the walk of shame back to the locker room. One cool feature about this match type is that each diva has a unique attire that is specific only to this mode of play. So Victoria, for example, is normally seen in this pink getup, but for this match type you'll see these threads. You can also select the color of undergarment for each participant, so you have some sort of exciting color to reveal when you're done. I don't know why you would do this. This is one that I played a lot more as a 17 year old teenage boy, but these days if I give it a go, it's more or less for a change of pace from the extreme chaos of the rest of the game. And the most subtle addition here would be the first blood match. I say this because it feels like a stipulation that's been available for quite some time, but this couldn't be further from the truth because Here Comes the Pain is the first game in the series to feature blood. I mean, is that even right? This match is as one might expect. Bust open the other competitor, and you win. Try to attack the ref enough times, and it's possible for Mr. Hebner himself to inflict bloodshed onto the wrestler, thus making him the victor. Gosh, that's just... that's just weird. And if you're feeling up to some endurance training, you can indulge in the three stages of hell, where any combination of three main event matches can be set up in a series. Okay, not any combination, because not every match type is available, there are some limitations, but most are here. And of course, one of the most historically proven party matches of all time, the Royal Rumble, is included here. Just Bring It introduced eight on-screen wrestlers at once for this match type, which was quite the technical feat for the time, but shut your mouth and here comes the pain taps out at six. Other than these minor changes, there isn't much to differentiate this one throughout the years. It's still ridiculously easy to eliminate others, and it's still fun doing so. And you can even eliminate yourself if you're the only wrestler in the ring and you time a diving attack just as the next entry hits the end of the ramp. This can also crash the game, so do this at your own risk. Not sure why you'd want to, but then again, I, I did it quite frequently so and it was rumored before release that the i quit and king of the ring matches would be offered up here but this wouldn't be the case by the time the game was released the latter is most likely due to the fact that the pay-per-view event was replaced by bad blood in 2003 but i'm not quite sure why they wouldn't have carried over i quit from the previous installment on to the create modes which is undoubtedly one of the most frequented areas of a wrestling game and for good reason. This is where your creativity can come alive, from designing a wrestler's physical appearance, to setting his or her moves, and even creating your own taunts, standing, walking, running, and winning animations, which, clearly evident by these clips, gives the player maybe too much freedom. There's truly a lot of options. If you're weird like me, you can express yourself with some bizarre creations, some that may or may not cause concern amongst your friends and family. Another very common use of this mode is to create real-life wrestlers that aren't available on the roster, such as those from other promotions, or the ones that were cut for one reason or another. 
I was always partial to creating old WCW guys, and with the inclusion of many different create parts mixed with the design tools, it's very easy to achieve the additional roster pieces you might be missing. One of my few complaints here would be the fact that over on the Xbox and GameCube during this time, we were given many more options to create entrance sequences, whereas here, we're limited to choosing from a theme song, an entrance movie, and a pre-rendered animation. New features like advanced morphing options and transparent clothing additions are a nice touch, but for the most part, you'll notice things are very close to what we saw in Shut Your Mouth. Furthermore, you can edit the movesets for any wrestler in the game, so if you'd like to see The Undertaker race down the ramp in a shopping cart, or have Vince McMahon perform some sort of martial arts demonstration on the stage, well, it's entirely possible. As I mentioned earlier, some of the move animations are a bit dated by this point, such as Big Show's Chokeslam, but this is where that can be remedied. Don't like it? Simply change it. And if you'd like to create a stable, well, you can do that as well, where multiple wrestlers can share a group name and even unique entrance animations, such as this DX inclusion for Triple H and Shawn Michaels. Unfortunately, even though Create a Pay-Per-View was rumored to be included, it didn't make the final build, so you won't be dreaming up your own shows here. But shows can be had in the game's season mode. Select from one of the many provided wrestlers or one of your own created masterpieces and take to a full year of living on the road as a WWE superstar. You'll start out by choosing which show you'd prefer to wrestle for, with Stephanie McMahon representing SmackDown and Eric Bischoff doing so for Raw. These are your go-to people for stuff like title shots or requests to team with other wrestlers, though you'll also run across other personalities that can assist in furthering your career path. Other allegiances can be formed and rivalries developed, as the player is often given options to how their wrestler will interact with others. Like post-match, for example, will you simply taunt after a victory, or will you choose to punish your opponent even more? A decision which I should note can backfire, resulting in your wrestler becoming the victim. You can also select to respect the other competitor after the match, but I've noticed that more often than not, I'm standing there left hanging feeling like a rejected prom date, so I usually opt for the more aggressive option, because screw you, other wrestler. Storylines are plentiful here, usually running the course of a full calendar month, generally beginning at one pay-per-view and ending at the next. Each of these storylines were written by actual WWE writers and contained cutscenes, player options, such as how to proceed with certain scenarios, and many result in title shots. You'll see events unfold, such as factions that the player can build, right down to being able to choose who will manage it, though these selections are mostly limited to a few options. And even a feud with the boss himself, Mr. McMahon, which is one of the most entertaining storylines from a wrestling game that I can remember. It's really put together quite well, and though these plots don't always flow together with fluidity, each one showcases something different and unique to help round out the year. Each show card contains only three matches, so even though you may be actively within a storyline, it's very possible to have a week or so off. But you can venture backstage at times to interact with specific people, where the correct decisions could possibly gain your wrestler SmackDown dollars, earn rating points, or even gain an advantage for your next match. On the flip side, disrespecting somebody could result in the opposite outcome. This option differs from previous titles as the player isn't given the freedom to explore areas of the arena in first person mode as once was offered. Now some didn't care for that feature so it wasn't missed by all but I always rather liked walking around and freely checking things out. Uh, can I, can I get some service here? Other options outside of playing matches consist of visiting the shop zone where earned money can be spent on unlocking things like hidden wrestlers, alternate attires, arenas, and movesets. And you can check out season stats here like title history and win-loss records. After all is said and done and you've blasted through the entire thing, you can actually carry over the stats you've created into another year, though technically it's just the mode restarting and doesn't offer anything new, but it's still nice to see who held what along with wins and losses. And holy cow, that my friends is WWE Smackdown, Here Comes the Pain. And even with as much depth 
as we went into. I'm sure there's still some things that were missed here, because that's just how deep this one goes. Yeah. And critics agreed, because our pals over at IGN gave it a 9.1, Game Informer an 8.5, and EGM a 7.5. They must not like good games or something. I think these days it's harder and harder to feel wowed by the new WWE games, because not only is the product not as hot as it once was, but there aren't as many innovations to be had in current times. If you look at the fact that the first SmackDown game was released just three years before this one and the marginal jumps that each game made leading up to this point, it's really quite remarkable and just couldn't be accomplished by today's standards. This game also represents a moment in time for many of us. I was 17 when this one released and wrestling along with gaming was life. I mean, I didn't have a job or kids or anything really to consume my days, so games like this did. And the impact can still be felt to this day, nearly 20 years later. It's a game that has withstood the test of time, a game that many are calling for to be remastered for current consoles, a game that sold many copies and still demands above average prices for the console, especially for a sports title or sports entertainment, pal. It's for all these reasons that this one will go down in history as one of the best wrestling titles ever to exist. And if you exist, why don't you hit that thumbs up button and drop a comment below. I would also greatly appreciate it if you'd subscribe to help this old channel grow some new subscribers. I genuinely hope that you guys enjoyed this video. I always try to make sure there's something for everybody and I try to be unbiased, though sometimes it's harder than others, like this video. There was a lot of butt kissing. But uh, I love this game and uh, you guys are great. You guys definitely keep me going and I'm thankful for your continued support. So thanks for watching. I hope you'll return. And for now, here comes the end. <laughs> that was lame.